So Rob Kreider, where do you go?
being that we met a lot of the people on the fringe sciences, so to speak, or at least the developmental sciences, um, I, I got uh, a great reputation for the integrity that my team possessed in the field, its honesty, and, and the way we approach our methodology. Um, we, we form no, no based opinion uh, whatsoever. We let the facts speak for themselves because when you've got, when you come from the history of investors buying into every moment of your day, you cannot waste time guesswork. Everything has to be nailed down and it has to work or you're out the door. So under these type of uh, uh, self-imposed regulations, um, we ended up taking on this in April. And the way that happened was, I know that uh, a lot of you know, you know the School of Mines down in Socorro and things like that. But we started work working with the NOS family on Victoria Peak and all this stuff, and we got involved with a few of the guys down there. And our integrity and our reputation was thus at the time that we were invited to go in and copy their entire archive, the second of their archive. And um, we, I believe we, we brought out about 900 pages of information that was voluntarily granted to our team from, that, from the school down there. So I just say that so that you can understand and appreciate the type of respect and integrity we had gleaned over 25 years in that, in that field. Now, being as also we work on a lot of the fringe sciences and we're the first in, first out. We're like first responders to an emergency or an accident scene. So when someone has an ancient mind or some type of historical situation going on that they can't understand, we're often the first brought in. This led to us getting known for this type of activity and being very discreet in the process. Um, we eventually were utilized by APD on the West Mesa gravesite, the largest gravesite in North America, um, or in the world. Um, our teams were brought in there behind the scenes. Uh, we were actually on, on Channel 13. It shows us in the background that we were unnamed. And we did a lot of work on finding out if there was any more burials and stuff and what was exactly on the ground with. So I also became an expert in uh, what they call geophysical phase reading, or reading passive magnetic fields, and the interpretation or interpolation of those magnetic fields once read with an instrument. So these are the backgrounds that I come across. Knowing the APD, knowing these other guys, and the things we do, the word spreads. It spreads pretty rapidly. Eventuality became to where Oxford University well, uh, let me back up just a second. We actually got into the Bigfoot thing in central New Mexico here because of reports people were bringing to us. Now, the reason being is they know I'm not going to criticize, I'm not going to judge, I'm going to sit down and take that information, and then maybe I'll see where that goes. And I'm not going to judge anyone. They're confident in that. So we began to get enough information come in that, that we, we thought, wow, you know, there's something got to be to this. It's not just, and it's not just your people's imagination. The unique aspect of that was no one said the word Bigfoot. Um, the people that were recording it had, that was the farthest thing from their mind. So as they would experience these things, they would relate to us information and details that had a commonality. And that commonality often pertained to traits attributed to Bigfoot, at least is what people say. And when I use that title, I use it rather loosely. Because I don't even like to say we're, we're studying Bigfoot. Because I don't know what this animal is that we're tracking and, and bringing back physical evidence of. Um, I, the title is going to be what the title becomes. Um, it's not for me to say it's the Bigfoot thing that everyone's talked about for 30 years. But that's irrelevant to me in that sense. The relevancy comes when we finally take a look and we see there is a physical aspect to this. There's a reality to it. There's enough unknowns to pull our interest in. Now, that's all. As you can imagine, the people that have worked with me over the years, these are technological professionals and scientists from Los Alamos and Sandia Labs and Lawrence Memorial Labs and other places. And they looked at me and immediately said, Bigfoot, what are you thinking? Even my team, a lot of the guys are ex-military and things, because some of the aspects we do, we do underground work per se, very dangerous work. Everything has to be tooth and nail perfect every single time or people can die. These guys are looking at me and they're practical, they're realists. They're looking at Bigfoot. Come on, boss, what are we doing? You're not doing this right now, are we? And I said, absolutely, we are. And they say, why? They say, because I've discovered there's reality to it. And what they do? Did they run? Did they hide for fear? No, they didn't. They took the drug from their associates and their peers, and they stepped forward into this with me. Not all of them did, because not all have a place. But what occurred was later on, um, as we began to put some information up online, because I got on there to start to see what's out there. Now, I've worked. 10 miles to 20 miles away from any road or, or potentials of human activity for years and years and years. So if there's something out there, I've encountered it. Um, and, and I can tell you, I've encountered things I don't know what they are and I don't understand yet. Um, that's not to say they may be something completely normal. 
But enough times I did experience what I can only consider to be a gigantic, hominid creature out in the wild of the wild. And these came from fleeting glimpses to in 1995, I was able to video one from the waist up. And I was around that animal for almost eight years. Um, every day, almost, for about eight months that I stayed on that side of the tent. That might seem extreme, but it's not. I mean, the kind of work we did, uh, no bathroom, no nothing, eight months in a tent. Um, and so you get, to, you get to really know what's in the environment. Every coyote, every fox, where the hawks are, who the young hawks are, the old hawks are. Everything comes clean. Well, here's this other thing there, making itself known almost daily, or nightly, I should say. So I got that video, and of course I started to put some data online. I went to look to see what was there. And it was just all crap. And I don't mean to really put anybody down, because a lot of the people who are hobbyists are trying very, very hard. They just have no clue what to do. And to be honest, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a zoologist, and I do not hold a degree. But I understand methodology, and I understand principle, because that's what I've done for 25 years. So I just applied the very same methodologies, the very same sciences, the very same disciplines, the very same equipment that we've done to these other things, and I put it to this task. And the reason I did that is because what was out there was so horrible. If anyone had a true interest, they never would be able to discover any truth whatsoever. All it would lead them deeper into do is say, why? And this is a mythical beast that parts glitter. And that's just not the truth. The, the, when, when I looked in, I wanted to also not just inject some, some qualifiable data, I also wanted to inject some integrity in the way that data is collected in other people. Because there's a great value to all the enthusiasts that are out there running around the woods. Even if it's not Bigfoot per se, their attention has merit. It can lead to other discoveries. But I wanted that attention to be brought forth with something that I could trust, if nothing else, so that I didn't have to dig through mountains and mountains of crap. So that's how we got going. We actually started to, produ to produce and to post information in a mannerism that was unlike anyone had seen before. These things were, of course, labeled and coded, and their, and their locations, and their times, and the temperature, and the wind, and everything else was being logged. And I actually got a lot of crap for that. Um, the, oh, look at you guys. You think you're this, you think you're that. And it's really just the way it's got to be done, and I'm sure you guys agree. Now, being when we started to make a movement in this deal, the other enthusiasts, some professional, some not, um, actually gained a little bit of confidence and started to contact us about inside information. Now, this is stuff from like um, forest rangers and people out of the BLM and the uh, Department of Agriculture and things like that. And so when you begin to get the backdoor information, now certainly I can't present much of that to you today because it's all up for interpretation. I mean, that's, that's hearsay neither here nor there. But I think I can give you a flavor to let you know that we have access or have had access and commonly do to information that most people are not privy to. Now, we're also entrusted with a lot of this information. So people from these agencies have come to us and said, man, you guys got to take a look over here. A couple of these times that, that it resulted from either human injury or death, death of livestock, or damage to property. Now, we started really getting in the dirt of this stuff. Oxford University heard about us. Brian Sykes, that was, was, he's a human geneticist for Oxford, and he was about to do a new study. And the study was called the Oxford Luzanne Collateral Hominid Project, or the OLCHP. The focus of that project was to discover if there was anything behind the rumor, basically, or so to speak. So they contacted us. The, when they did this, um, they, they requested us to get them specimens or samples, and we already had in-house a couple that we were really quite confident in, but they weren't the best in the world, and we sent those in to them. Now, Brian also requested, and we talked to the backside, that they would love to get something fresh, basically. If not plucked out of something living, at least something that was viable, so that, so that they could get the highest propensity or the highest chance that they had of recovering DNA. They didn't trust most of the samples they were getting in return worldwide. Um, and they put out this call worldwide for specimens. So they held a study for two months for us to get a, 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 a sample off of a living specimen. And I say that only in the fact that like, when we collected hair from this, in this case, it still had a hydrated follicle, estimated 30 or 15 to 45 minutes uh, old, so probably half an hour old off the animal. Um, and we also, this was accompanied, uh, we purposely went up to do this, and it was accompanied with trace evidence in the form of tracks, handprints. Uh, we also found food remnants with bite imprints, um, 
what looked like after three individuals and cooperative hunting techniques, projectile use, and a few other things. And so all this accompanied this, this sample we now we're going to send into Oxford. Now, the confusing part about that is this was the big deal. You may, some of you may have heard about it, may not. It was covered by the AP and internationally for about a year and a half. And it was about a year that everyone waited for the results. Now, like I said, they held the study for two months. Um, and so we did finally provide what they held that study for. And, and which is, you can think it's against all odds, but it's not with good work and hard work. It's not. Nothing is. And so, so we, we sent in the next sample. Now, the, the confusing part that I just want to, I'm going to quickly go over is, and it leads into the KOAT, KRQE, the whole nine yards. This is the flavor of what happens when you come up with good, uh, uh, a good qualified data or quantitative data. Is that, like we sent in this sample, it was, it was, the, the custody was absolutely perfect. It was all video tr uh, transfer into their containers, done a hermetic chamber. Um, everything was done correctly. The collection was, was witnessed by an anthropologist, by a, a ten-year veteran of the U.S. Forest Service who was there while we were doing the collection. We had it nailed down. And that's because look what we're about to provide, right? It has to be right. So we did that. Now, that's the scary part once it gets in the hands of a university or someone because now they have a sample that every, all, the, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So, boy, if I, if I get nervous about this and I don't want to live up to this to my peers, I can't even assume or accuse this to be bad in any way because everything's been done. So we provided it. Now, we waited for the results like the rest of you did. I got letter after letter from Mr. Sykes. And when it all came down, and I want to bring up a couple of inconsistencies here because they map out how this information has been treated and why you don't know about this truth, is that he released to the AP and the, the, the entire world that, and these details are important, that for one, every single sample was checked by biologists against its morphology to qualify it for the test. They stated in the focus, and we have it here actually, we stated in the focus of this study that no samples known would be checked. In other words, if it was from a known animal, and, and, and this is something that a, a third year student should be able to determine, is if it's from a known animal, it does not go through the DNA testing process. That's how you qualify all your samples. So nothing should have been tested if it was a known, period. So when they come out in the AP and they release, oh, our results were a bear, a wolf, a possum, a 30,000-year-old polar bear that we didn't know was still around. When they talk about stuff like that, why didn't the, the best in the world, which is the, those at the Museum of Zoology in Lausanne, Switzerland, why couldn't they qualify or, or discriminate a bear, a fox, a wolf, a possum? Why couldn't they tell those things? Now, these are the best in the world, and this is the ba this is base based stuff. I'm not a scientist whatsoever. But I can look at a scale pattern and hair structure and medulla, and I can do the same thing. Now, we look at that and we say, wait a second, hit the brakes. Because not only should nothing have been tested, I mean nothing should have been tested. You should have been offering no, no finalization to the study. This was not a study on polar bears. This was not a study on possums. Now, the interesting part is, then I receive a letter. Now, I know that one of mine was unknown. The morphology was completely unknown on the first one. I received notification of that before they released those results to the AP. But that sample, and it being unknown, was not mentioned in any press release worldwide. Not one. Now, I question that myself. So now here come the new results, and another letter from Brian Sykes. And Brian tells me, in this letter, and I have it here today, we can actually take a look at it if anyone's curious, that the, sam the first sample, again, was unknown, but it, no recoverable DNA. And this is, we didn't doubt this, because we had a broken hair shaft. We didn't, have the, we didn't have the follicle. We didn't have good cells. Now, the second hair is not that case. This is the good one. This is the one they should have laid their entire study down on because it had so much other qualified data behind it, personnel, input, everything was done right. Trace of custody, everything was perfect. That sample was never tested. He told me that sample was not tested whatsoever, and it's being curated by the Museum of Zoology in Lausanne, Switzerland, in hopes of a future study. Now that is an exact contradiction to what they released to the AP, saying that every sample they received was qualified and tested. In other words, qualified being quality control and it's kicked out because it's a polar bear hair. Now this doesn't match up. Why? It's, it's not that I'm trying to call shots or anything else. I just want to raise the question because this is the way it went down. 
And anyone who would like copies of these emails or anything else that would like to follow up on any of this is more than welcome to, and I'll give you all the information you need. Now this brings us almost to the future, um, or to the present, I should say, not quite to what's about to happen. So this, this brings us almost up to UNM. When we did the site study, I released that information. KOAT News here in Albuquerque immediately hit us and said, what in the world's going on? So we brought them up and we showed them. Out of what we presented to them, they produced a 22-minute documentary. Anna Vasquez wrote us an email and said it was so compelling that it had even the hardcore skeptics in the studio second-guessing what they thought they knew. Now, this is a 22-minute documentary special, news special, produced by them on our results, us as the primary. A little bit of inclusion with some other group stuff and including finding Bigfoot quotes from the famous Matt Moneymaker. Um, Anna suddenly, the night it was going to air, that the ad afternoon from the night it was going to air, she wrote us in a half panic and she was so apologetic. And she said that when it went to the studio heads and they viewed it, that it scared them so bad that they had them chop that down to a three and a half minute piece in which we were in it less than 30 seconds. And the reason being, and I have it in the emails, the reason being is they didn't want to spread unnecessary fear. Now, so what they did show in that 30 or 45 seconds of us was incorrect location, incorrect dates on the video, incorrect information across the board. Now, I have to ask you why again. There we go again. Now, why? What's wrong with the truth? Now, if it's just information, it's just data, it's just physical evidence, I'm not giving my opinion here. What's wrong with this? Is truth out the window now? Because all I'm saying is this, and we just present this. Okay, if it's too much to handle, I'm sorry. If a studio head gets scared, fine. But is it their job to declare what's going to be too fear or too scary for the rest of you? And is, then, is that news? It isn't. This isn't journalism. It isn't news. So we think and we take for granted that we're going to be hearing and receiving information if it comes to light. Which brings me to another study that we'll talk about in depth in a moment. And that's the Melba Ketchum study. Because the study's been done, the genomes are out there, it's been accepted, and it's listed. So if, if it comes to that point, they're saying the species exists. Now just because it hasn't passed the peer review in, in that circle, which it actually has and been published. Now, so when it got published, what they say? Oh, the journal's no good. See, that's what I'm getting at here. You can have the best in the world. And as soon as they say the word Bigfoot, he's a crazy. You can have the best labs in the world, and as soon as they say Bigfoot, oh no, they contaminate everything in their junk. You can have the finest on the planet, and it doesn't matter. The prejudice is so great that as soon as you say Bigfoot, they're an idiot, they're an idiot, they're an idiot. Now, we're trying to break through this fence right here. This is the, what we are trying to do. And I don't really care. I can't get blacklisted. Uh, my peers can't do a thing to me. I've already earned my respect in the things that I do. I have nothing to fear. That's an important position on my end. Because if anyone's going to step in between the hobbyists and academia and the truth and the falsity, it has to be someone that really doesn't give a crap. Because they're going to put pressure on you, and I have received that pressure already, in the form of lies by KOAT at one point. Now, KOAT, that all comes up. What happens as a result of that? We want to go get some more verifiable evidence. Because we've been pushed backwards, right? So now we want to prove it. What happens? Our guy in the U.S. Forest Service comes up to us and hands me a sheet of paper, an internal memo. And on that sheet of paper, it describes that area now is completely off limits and closed, and it will be during a so many months duration every single year forever. This is in the face of the Sandias. And I can quote it. I have a piece of paper here as well if anyone would like to review it. But I can quote that piece of paper and why they closed that area. They said it was to reduce the potential for adverse interaction between sensitive and rare species and humans. Now that's an interesting thing if we've ever read U.S. Forest Service reports or internal memos before. Because for one, there's an article just about for every species that are out there. There's a number for protection acts already in place. None of those were listed on this act. Now that's pretty interesting in itself because it talks about interactions. It doesn't talk about the effects on the species is the way it's normally worded. It talks about to reduce the potential risk of adverse interaction. That's very important to think about between humans and rare and sensitive species. Now I ask you, in the face of the Sandias, these trails have been open for 25 years. There's, no, there's nothing going on there. They've never been blocked. So what is the rare and sensitive species since they refuse to list it or the order number adjusted to that species? 
See, this is what we come to constantly. Now, this is an inner office memo within the Department of the U.S. Forest Service, which has to be generated by the Department of Agriculture. So you can see what levels that, and how the response is gleaned when we pop up to something. So there we go. Whole section of the forest closed. Well, what do we do? Okay, we're not going to play this game. We'll back off to one of the three or four other research areas we've got going at the time, which we did. Our results were so phenomenal at one of the, the basin river systems, which is what we would call the domicile or family habitable zone, which are a lot of these low-lying river bosques and things like that. Um, and we started, we were having so much success in there gaining physical evidence as well as photographic, audio, absolutely amazing audio stuff. And, and, and we were being presented this. Well, this got the attention of the U University of New Mexico Gallo, who, by the way, it wasn't their decision, in a sense, or the executive director's decision to really go after this. The local population, the demographic there, sees this as one of the most important things there is. Because I'm going to give you the reality of it either way. There is something out there that has the potential to rip a horse in half. There's something out there that has the potential to tear both legs off a living cow and stuff it headfirst into a pipe. These things are happening. Knocking mobile homes off of their pillars. Um, tearing uh, uh, appliances from the windows of, of trailer house and things like this. These are the problems that we went and we began to get involved in. So the director of UNM was taking a serious look. He's also an anthrop PhD anthropologist. So it was right up his alley. Now he's working with a Navajo every day. In the Navajo, this is not a myth, it's not a fantasy or anything else. This is their history. They're actually attributed to saving their people during the long walk. Because when they got back from the long walk, all the elders and the children had survived in the Chuska Mountains. And they asked them, how in the world did you live through the last four winters? Because there was no one to feed you, no one to house you. And they told them the hairy men took care of us. Now, to them, and to, to treat this as if it is a myth, is an absolute insult to people who live it as a reality. They see these things, they deal with them. So much so that the Navajo Police Department has a special department for these types of investigations, which is actually how we got involved. They worked with a group for almost 15 years called, uh, they're called Crypto Four Corners, and they responded with the Navajo Police on these calls, because who was better to work on them? Um, and almost everyone in that was either ex-military or a thug or whatever, they were pretty tough guys. And they responded to stuff like this for like 10 years with the Navajo Reds. Now, we're not hearing about any of this, right? We have all these calls going in, there's calls going out, there's responses, there's, there's, there's damage, there's death, and we don't, we're not hearing about any of this. Same thing. Why? So what eventually happens is UNM, through J.C. Johnson, who ran Crypto Four Corners, <coughs> they wanted to get physical evidence. They wanted, they wanted to start hammering some of this stuff down. So they called in our team. We responded to two locations, and one was the Chuska Mountains, to a witness event where a native had actually watched one run over a small pine sapling, which is a great opportunity to try to collect some physical evidence. So to validate for myself and, and as well others that what we are doing and what we've been fighting and, and the methodology we learned is correct, I took this opportunity. Now, I didn't know where the witness, where the witness encounter happened. I had no clue. The director of the university was there and about seven other people. So at the top of the mountain, this apparently happened somewhere at the bottom of the mountain, at the top of the mountain I told him, about 2,000 feet above him I guess, we finally figured out, I said, I'm just going to hop out of the truck. I took another guy, I said, if anything went up down this mountain, it left sign. And I'm going to go try to track sign. And I will catch up, we have radios, I said, I'll catch up with you guys later. So I got out of the truck. I've never been in the Chuska Mountains. I have never even set foot there before. Within about 15 minutes, we found the first sign. Now, these were in the form of 16-inch tracks breaking the pine needles and things, but they were pretty dispersed because it was just walking around. It also messed with a little bit of the foliage. We tracked this to a location where it was digging through a log, and then it, was, and then it had apparently got spooked and ran down the mountain because it took off. You could see where it kicked. And then it was running steps down the mountain, step gaps up to 10 feet. Now, the funny part is, as we tracked this down the mountain, where did we end up? 2,000 feet down there, right? The witness episode, encounter episode. We had tracked the very same subject that the witness saw without knowing anything about where it was or anything else, and we tracked it right across that little pine sapling that he ran across. So we tracked out about a mile and a quarter with the tracks. Now, that surprised everybody. Oh my gosh, wow. Part of the story of this was that the Bigfoot had disappeared, that he had stepped into another realm or another world. Because in their belief systems, man, if you can't track it, then it's vanished. Because they're great. These guys are excellent trackers. 
but they're not prepped to prime to track something like what that is. It's, these animals are very intelligent critters. They understand their marks, and I'm gonna give you that right now. Um, I speak to you as if it's a real thing because that's, that's, this is the experiences I'm relating to. Now, when he began to get, relate that story that he walked into another world, I looked at the executive director and I just told him like this, and we started making circles. Now, about 300 feet, no, no, let me back up, about 100 feet from the witness encounter, I picked up tracks again. And I picked them up for about another 100 until he turned and went up behind a big tree. And I asked the guy, so how did it go down? Where did he disappear? He says, oh, well, he actually ran off and ran down, and then he lost sight of him. But my brother was right behind him, he says. And he says, my brother was right behind him, he says, so he must have just vanished. And we looked, and what he had done was just ducked behind a tree with about a three and a half, four foot diameter. And in doing so, he had a stob on the ground and peeled some flesh and lots of hair. And there was also flesh and lots of hair, or there was a, lots of hair, I should say, on the pine sapling as well. So there we gathered our DNA evidence for the UNM, for the first bout of it for the UNM study. You'll, you'll notice, if you watch the KRQB presentation, they stated that absolutely zero has come from any of those efforts. Now, I didn't lay zero on the table. Um, what I laid on the table is, is, is above zero. Um, there's hair there. There's scat there. That's physical evidence. There's cast of tracks there. That's trace evidence. Now, for them to come so far and to say that all resources were put forward with no results certainly isn't true. The other part I'd like to get back to the UNM thing and the acquisition made by KRQE that I think we can, we can erase most of here today is that tax money or resources were used in the study, and they were not. I've spent over $7,000 since last January. This year, my own money out of my own pocket. I do construction for 30 bucks an hour when I can get it. Okay, so no one paid for that. We paid for that. So is it not only bad that we get accused of tax fraud, basically, that there's no appreciation for the amount of money or where the resources came from to provide the data from the study? And this is the way it went down, and I show you the physical evidence to prove it. Now, as well, they said that there was an expedition, and this expedition cost $7,000. And what I'm going to tell you is there was a public disclosure seminar that took two days, largest attendance ever in 47 years. Matter of fact, it more than doubled the largest attendance ever in 47 years at UNM Gallup. If that doesn't show public interest, that this should be studied, I don't know what does. More so than anything else the college has ever done. Now that cost him money to put that together. That's where that money came from. But I need to remind people, it was discretionary money. In other words, it can be used for a pool party, buying pizza, painting posters, anything they want to do with it. Anything for, for wellness, or school spirit, or anything else. And instead it was applied to science, or it was attempting to, and the disclosure of the results of science to the public. This is what KRQ attacked that university for. Now that doctor's being blacklisted. He's being thrown out. He's being assaulted, accused. We've had NAMO guys that dropped completely. These are excellent researchers and trackers. They've been involved for four or five years. We can't even get a hold of them anymore. They won't even answer their phone. They're so embarrassed. Why? Why? This is all good science. Walking through the front door. Now why is it being handled this way? And that brings us back to a couple other, a couple other things. We did... We did the UNM DNA, then we say, well, where did that end up? Okay, since we did have results. Well, we had the doctor bring in a professor from Idaho State University who's been working on the Bigfoot Enigma for about 30 years. His name's Don Jeffrey Meldrum. Um, and, and, uh, and we actually requested him. We could have brought him in when we wanted. We wanted the DNA samples and the, and the evidence we were going to provide to be sent to several domestic laboratories, hopefully academic-based. And to get these things within the region, there's no reason to send them overseas, and to send a bunch of independent labs to get this work done. Well, we really didn't, I'm, I'm not going to point too many fingers, but we didn't hear back anything on that DNA samples and stuff we gave them for about a year. As a matter of fact, until we scheduled this conference that we're now discussing. And upon the morning of that conference, we asked him, where did our DNA go? We handed it to you. That's the custody. Where did it go? He said, well, I sent it to Brian Sykes in Oxford. But what? What? They just blocked every bit of science that has come up on this so far that has any credibility. Our entire point was to do this through domestic universities, domestic laboratories, 
and get these results in independently so we can begin to work on them. But no, we never received word from Brian Sykes. I have no sample number for ever being admitted into any lab or any, any place to curate the sample. I have no word from anyone, and it got left at that. Now I ask you, is that, is that what you do at university levels? No, it's not. And I, like I say, I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm not a scientist. But I've worked around those groups since the 80s, and I've worked with those groups since the 80s, and I know that's not how you do things. So that samples, I don't know if they thought that was all we had or what, and it certainly wasn't. Um, so we're still waiting now to work with other laboratories. But KRQE steps in and does this and puts such a hammer that he's scared to even open the door or the box on this anymore. So you can see how this gets closed up. It doesn't matter how good the evidence is. It doesn't matter how good the laboratory is. How, how popular a scientist is, it's irrelevant. When it comes down to it, if you put the word Bigfoot on it, it's trash, no matter what you do. Now, that's a lot to step through. And, and, and we, or I, and my team are doing it. We're actually prepared to try to jump up and step through this hoop. I understand it. I know what the difficulties are going to be. One of them is speaking to you guys tonight. This isn't speaking to a peer group of Bigfoot enthusiasts who already believe and want to hear stories. What I'm speaking to is a group of people who are probably very intelligent and informed that haven't had access to or received the right information. Now, that all I ask here is I'm not trying to prove the existence of Bigfoot whatsoever. My entire focus here is to only demonstrate the necessity, if not the justification, for study. That's it. And I want to remind, I mentioned in the thing that I was going to be just talking about the definition of science, and that being is Science studies the unknown, does it not? It doesn't study the known. Once it's known, it's, it's, it's a fact. It goes in the archive. It goes in the book. It's history. It is no longer science in that respect. Science is a, a discovery process. You cannot discover what you know. So the moment you think you know, you've already limited what you're going to discover. Is that not true? So when we say, oh, everything out there in the woods, that's known. And if it was new, we'd hear about it. Would you? Would you? Is there a vested interest anyone has to disclose this information to you? When, it, when, when the genetics, and we can get into this a little bit, when the genetics come back partially human, and it does this on 300 genomes, and it's published and accepted in Zubank Gen Lab, or in, in Zubank uh, Gen Archive, so, in other words, uh, the local flora and fauna, all the animals on the planet are in these archives. There's GenBank and there's Zubank. Zubank has accepted and published this under the name Homo sapiens cognatus, your blood relative. Now there's the problem. What happens if you have a bunch of 10-foot kind of human things running around living where they want, doing what they want, eating what they want? They don't have to worry about boundaries, lines. Now isn't that the true definition of human rights? Now that brings into reflection what about us, for one. That's an aspect nobody wants to go there. The other thing is the lid's been kept on it since the early 50s. The science is done by the FBI released science in the early 70s um, on, on the species. It was listed in local flora and fauna. It was listed by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, it, to let people know what animals they may encounter in the wild up until 1975. So with all this going against us, with all this happening, how in the world would you ever know? How would you ever know? It's always left in an essence of maybe and almost always on the side of no way. Now, I've been offered five television shows. Have you seen me on TV? No. The reason being is because I won't say what the script says. We actually do this for a living. I brought a TV crew in to a place and within 200 foot of a large female, and when she grunted at us, all the film crew ran. They left. These are big wigs. I have the director of network development. This was being filmed for Animal Planet. They ran. What do you expect? What can, what can be done? They want to show that scripted, that you say what they want, that gives offers the time to the skeptical viewpoint as well, even if it's against physical evidence. Physical evidence speaks for itself. There's no debate. But that's what they want. They want the question left open. They want it to be a myth. So being that is, I, I think that I've probably explained pretty well how the information steers around and why it's so difficult to get anything confident. Um, we can get into now, I can start to begin to show you a few of these things would be, this, was the, this is some of the information on the Melba Ketchum study and focus. And 
she, she's one of the most accredited geneticists on the planet. She had her own genetic company. Um, as, and we have actually a write-up at the end of this, anyone who wants one, I think we have 27 copies, that go into some of the DNA, the study, scientists that back up her work, other scientists that have repeated the study, and things, it's all on the table and paper there, anyone can pick them up before they go. Um, you'll get some more background with her as well. But what we see is she's extremely accredited. She's highly, highly uh, intuitive with the work she does. She's, one of the, she's a pioneer in, in, in the works of genetics. She worked with uh, the gene, horse genome project and some other things, doing the first genomic study of horses and dogs. And, and her, her, her genomic results were what were used to value racehorses and the millions of dollars. She's also worked on forensic cases, and she's had things tried based on her opinions and her ideas and information. Now, what's interesting is, as I said, you can take someone of this caliber, a pioneer in genetics, and they say the word Bigfoot, and they're automatically blacklisted, they're out the door. Now, she mapped, she's, she acknowledges in this study alone, which was called the Sasquatch Genome Project, backed by a man named Erickson. In this study, a myriad array of scientists and laboratories were involved. They mapped the complete genomes on over 140 subjects. And I'm sure we all remember the Human Genome Project. Big deal to map the human genome. She's mapped 100 Sasquatches' genome. That's how they finally ended up getting Zubank to, ed, ed, to accept this. When it was to go around and publish for peer review, two solid years it was turned down because it stated what it was for. So that was removed. So then all of a sudden, a bunch of labs picked it up. So I, scientists looked at it and said, absolutely, and signed off on it until they found what it was for. Then they demanded that retracted. Well, then a new, a new science journal that had come out just a couple years previous decided we'll take a look at it. And they did. And when they did, they found it to be not only, not only competent, but they found they could repeat it. And they found it to be viable. And they said, yes, we'll absolutely publish this. It's good work until their legal department stepped in. Their lawyers said, Yo, you will not publish this. The flat backdraft, the whole nine yards of this, no one's going to face. This was an attorney making a decision on what you know exists in this world. A single man in a legal department, not a science journal. So when you think the peer review process is solely based on judgment, on repetition, on science, and it goes through the avenues, it's not. It's just as much on everything from ego and fear as it is economic reasons, which is why the legal party did not want the Science Journal to publish it. So the Erickson Group came up with enough money, and they bought the journal. Now, what? Now they're accused they self-published because they own the journal that published the paper. Fact is, they have the full signatories. It was being published. It was approved before they bought the journal. But you see how this gets turned around. So now, even though it has been approved, peer-reviewed, and published, accepted by Zubank into the genomic list of the flora and fauna. It's still, no one knows about it. We're still in here debating the existence of a creature that is listed in Zubank to have a genetic code, which means it's a creature. It's been classified. Now, where do we jump through the hoop now? What is the last and final step there would be for the general population to know? That's right. That's a media outlet. That is an avenue for you to hear about it. So if, you're not, if you don't look and actively search and dig through the absolute mountains, and I'm not kidding you, of worthless information to get to the truth, unless you do that, you're not going to know. Because they're not going to just outright tell you. Now that's kind of a shame. Because it's got a large impact. It has a, a socio-religious impact, socio-economic impact. As well as, what about the Forest Service? Haven't they known? Hasn't anyone in academia known? Has the Bureau of Land Management? Don't they know? If these things exist and it's already listed and it's classified and it's in Zubank's uh, database, how do they not know? Okay, it raises two questions. One of incompetency, right? Or one that they're not telling us the truth. And you don't want people to start wondering any of this stuff and start to lose confidence in any of these ages or their agencies or any of these authorities. That's a big deal, because with that comes potential, with, with the existence of a, of a real creature comes the potential for real danger to the people that are in its environment. Any large creature often whacks a smaller creature at one point or another. This has actually occurred. 
as well, you're not going to read about these things unless you really dig. And some of these you have to go right into FBI investigations to find out information. Why is the FBI involved? But they only get involved in humans. There's, they should never be involved in an animal attack. Yet we see these things. This is an indicator to you that something's going on that's not correct. And it's got a real potential danger for the public in certain areas, not everywhere. And what we're finding out about the species is, as a whole, they're not dangerous or aggressive. But they certainly can be. I've been injured on two occasions. One of them I have on video. Um, I know that a cow didn't sneak up on me, and, and we got a video and throw a rock and hit us with a rock at 50 miles an hour. And it, it, injured, it injured me. These things possess a threat, even if they're not trying to actually hurt you. Humans are fragile creatures. Now, we've had some episodes in the Sandias. This is where it got pretty weird. Because when you start to put two and two together, which is what no one wants anyone to do, trust me, you begin to realize, wow, they're not only occupying some of the more remote or rugged regions of our state, but hey, everything that goes with an animal in the natural order exists with this creature, which means, wow, I could be upset one day. It could have offspring and be upset that being overprotective of its offspring. It could be in the rut or feeling a pheromonic reaction and as well be defensive or, or aggressive. Now, as long as everyone's saying it doesn't exist, well, certainly there's no danger, is there? So get on out there on the woods and, and trails and have yourself a good time okay, until something happens. And then when it does, no one says, no one comes clear, no one's come clean and says, what might have done that? Because then what? A simple economic impact is California State Parks. They receive over $80 million a year in admission fees alone. Now, we all know the admission fee when you go to a state park, that's nothing. That's the cheapest expenditure, is it not? But we're talking $80 million alone just in admission fees, just in state parks. It's not monument land, state land, BLM land, or anything else. So we're talking, relative speaking, tens of billions of dollars a year, if not far more. That's how you groceries and gas and travel and everything else. Now, the propensity for losing that type of revenue is enough by itself. But what about the liability? What about 30 years of saying, oh, no, it's cool, go to the woods? And all the relatives that have lost people that come up missing, or there has been many, many cases of maulings by something unreal that rips people apart. What about when all that comes back and the family says, wow, I wonder if that's what that was? Didn't you guys know about it? Well, there's only two answers then, isn't there? There's the one, though, we didn't know, back to incompetence. Or, well, we knew, but we didn't have the, the means to tell you because maybe it wasn't accepted. Well, that's right back to the other part now, isn't it? So, between all this gruff, there's a reality flowing through it. And we're bumping the edge of what can be held back in secrecy now. Our understanding is we've gained enough understanding of the species now to not only predict their behavior, but often even their location which has enabled us to go in and do things like collect hair 15 minutes or five minutes behind the subject. You can see right through it. It's actually translucent. That's because it does not contain a medulla. These are hollow. So they're very similar to human hair, except they, they are hollow hairs. And these are what we consider the large guard hairs in the creature, or the, or the longer hair. Um, this instance, you'd also think normally or naturally that the black section would probably be the base, and it's not. The base is on this end, and it widens to a taper near the tip, and that taper comes to a point after that. Now, the translucency is all throughout the hair. You may see some examples of that through these photos. And, um, and that's what we've been kind of seeing. The light spectrum comes back purple where the black is. It's not necessarily black. But being semi-translucent makes an interesting combination out in the woods. The Cheska, this is some feeding remnant stuff that was on the Cheska Trail. Um, and it just has the proper attributes for the way the bone was bit off and the marrow was pushed out with something that left scratch marks on the inside of the bone that shoved the marrow out, which is not really consistent with any other animal. This is actually the stump where we tracked him to, and he was digging out and pulling things out from beneath this stump, which is like the beetle dust and things. And then we tracked him from there on a little further. Like I said, this is out of order, so bear with me. This is actually a shot. We have some really good equipment. I have a mobile laboratory built out of a 52-foot semi-trailer by Sandia National Labs. And we own that in the boat and use that since 2005. And inside, it's back, it's quite a, big, quite a nice fine gear. And this is some of the stuff off our big scopes. This is the scale pattern or scale morphology to the Chuska Bigfoot hairs. 
And you can see here just what the pattern is. These are the type of patterns that they should have been able to qualify all the hairs worth that went into the big study that Oxford did. Here we have, uh, this is a 16 inch print and it's shown in line with a couple others that are difficult to see. These are just the record tracks. Here's actually where he was peeling the bark off a tree um, and this is where they apparently surprised him on the mountain. Some pictures of the hair, another picture of one of the track. Um, I'm just going to go through real fast. Here you can actually see uh, the back of the track, front of the track, 16 inch, and you can see the toe protrusions where they busted down into the pine needles a little bit. These are not good trackways, so we won't spend time on them. This is a hair snag off the Cheska hair where you duck behind the tree, and you can see when it's illuminated how translucent the hair is. This is solid black hair. So if, I, if we go up into another, if I can find it real quick, sorry about that. Um, you can see how black these hairs are, but when you backlight them, um, you'll notice that they are absolutely translucent. They kind of have a purple color. This is interesting in the woods, because when light comes through the hair and, try and broadcast a little bit of the surrounding color through your hair, you become very, very difficult to see. It also has a lot to do with light refraction and why pictures are hard to take. This is the sapling that ran down. There's the uh, J.C. Johnson for Cryptic Four Corners. That is the director of UNM University right behind him. Um, here we actually see, and we, I'm sure we can see them here, we'll pull them up. You can see strands actually stuck to the sapling here. And this is where the Cheska hairs were obtained from, where we ran over that sampling. And here's a good picture, I guess I should say, of where the, on forecast light, how dark or how black the hairs appear until you backlight them. Now that was the hair we ran over. Here's uh, a couple of pictures of scat. This is from the Cheska, and you'll see it's also packed, it has animal protein and it has uh, a lot of stuff from nuts and berries and things like that in it. Some would attribute to these to, to bear and it very well could be in the Cheska Mountains. It just was associated with the large hominid print. Now we'll go up real fast and we'll go and get an actual photograph. This is the area that we work the most. Um, and you'll see it's got quite a bit of files here into it. Um, GLST, this is the region in the wintertime. Uh, where we actually are doing most of our research. The family unit, who the tracks here on the table are from a specific family group. And bear with me, I'm going to go through some files here and just we're going to highlight a few. This is who we call George. This is the same print that is on the table, but this is, of course, in a far different location, about five different miles away. This was the day we watched the large female pick him up and carry him off. On the following day, we always go in, we measure, we find everything to see what we just encountered. This is what, these are some of the prints that were left behind on the ground. She ranged prints all the way to 20 inches. So in this, you can see the overall impression from the great toe, the taper, the heel. I know it's difficult to see, you have to bear with me. And that, that's, that print runs right at 19 to 20. These just happen to be foliage where they were knocked down, laying down and things. Another unique aspect is what we see as cut grasses. Now, again, affiliated only with the hominid prints. Um, I don't know how they're doing the cutting. I don't know what, it, what tool they're using. I don't know. But there's no human activity whatsoever. We find the giant hominid prints, and then we find where they sit in there and get into cutting these grasses. As you can see here, they're cut blade by blade because the tall grasses are not chopped here, but lower stocks are. It's really interesting and we don't know what's going on here exactly. All we can do is suppose that it's for bedding material since it's always done around October. This is actually one hair sample that's over there. It's in a clear container. And this is one of the ones from the GLST group. And it was, it was associated with both hominid prints and a hominid scat pile full of Russian olive and animal protein. Now we'll go on in. I believe we can get a picture. We'll just get one right of Mama here. These were the shots. And I'll try to get in, in, they should have been a little bit of order. So as you can see in this, we are about, or actually just, just under a mile away. This is with a 70 millimeter lens on the Sony uh, SLR. And we've got quite a 400 fell elevation. When we popped over this ridge, she grabbed a, a young one and took off. And this is one shot of her back. And I know it looks a little bad. We've done some work on it. I'll show you her a little better. Um, and this is her taking off. But it shows how shy they are because, I mean, at almost a mile, we just raised up half of our bodies to get this footage, and she took off. And you can see this is the same shot, of course, and now all we see is her head behind the foliage where she's moving around. 
And here in the, this shot is the one that really, really shows. This is pretty amazing. It doesn't look like much until we do some enhancement work on it. But I want to point out here is this is, this is the glutes. This is her butt. This is her arm and elbow and shoulder and her head. And the reddish deals coming around her are the arms of George. He's slightly chestnut brown. He's reddish brown. And she is picking him up, carrying him away. He's the one that left that 13-inch track over there. And she picks him up like a toddler. And in this shot, if we look up, I've cropped a lot of this out. But this is a, this, we do not enhance or change anything in this. This is what's called a vector scope filter. It works on light frequency instead of the visible light. And so when we use the light frequency, and I'll show you in a minute, she's one of the only things in the entire frame that comes up, even at that distance. But it's interesting is based, even though the color is different, George, the kid, and her both show up in the vector scope. So the light frequency is very similar, even though the visible color is different. And what we see here is his head peering around her head looking at us, and, and his arm wrapped around her, and this is actually the other arm and head. And this is her eye and nose and chin and the large cranium and the large traps attached. And you can see scaled. This is an actual scale. This was done with survey techniques. When we first scaled her using the bottom system here, we scaled her at about nine feet. Okay, and this is off every known we could figure out. Then when we went down there and used survey techniques on her, she came back bigger. So, and so we were good with a conservative estimate. But this is accurate. She's 10 foot slightly crouched. Now, what I want to point out though, how many people would it take to fill her suit if she was a suit? You see how many of that guy right there is 5'9". It'd take two of him to fill one leg. Six people could go and climb inside her body and walk around. Now this isn't a fake photograph. This is a real photograph of a real animal. This vector scope technology, this is the pure image, of course. And you can see even in the pure image, even better. She's actually got George's legs in her arm. George's arm's around her shoulder, he's peering around her head, and this is his other arm. Glutes, left leg, calf, right leg, calf, shoulder, elbow, forearm. Now, it's, it, it does show up a little better once you vector scope the image, of course, but the other was not even changed. These are stock photos, and, and I'm going to show you the distance at what she's really at. That's how far away she is from us in this picture. And she took off the moment we came over this ridge. So when they talk about why can't you get a picture of them? Deer don't do that. Bear don't do that. Nothing does that. At a mile, animals don't even regard your presence at a mile. Even animal. That's actually where we were at when we took the photos. And she spotted us on that hill and bolted. That's how, how much they can see. Uh, this is a vector scope uh, working with light frequency, and you can see here we even have, uh, this could be repeated, here's the filter steps, uh, what the filters were done in, uh, legacy, uh, everything else. So this type of vector format. Now you'll notice that she is, she is a different type of frequency response than even the vegetation comes back in being the bluish purple basically showing up, comes from that same hair color we've got on the table, when we focus light behind it, we get the same identical, identical frequency of light coming off this subject. So to us, that's one way I look at photographs. People say, oh, it's like a big foot in that picture. Yeah, I throw in a picture scope right now. And I want to see if that light re frequency is coming back from anywhere else in the frame. So sure, we get some contrast response, but we have nothing else in the frame that matches that identical frequency, yet when I check those hairs, they match her. So when you line up enough of that, and you line up enough of these things and the traits, then it's kind of hard to dispute. So this again, same thing, a little, little softer image. And this is the first survey stuff, like I said, we actually scaled her at nine feet conservatively. And that's when we went down, this is before we went down and redid the survey technique. So um, I, guess, I guess we could probably about go to Q&A you know, a sec. I figure I'd show a little bit of what some of the tracks look like that aren't here. And, and I'll run through these kind of quick. So if anybody wants to see any, because um, they're not rare. And we find hundreds and hundreds of them. And as you would be with any living animal. This one, you might note, is about five and a quarter inches long. This is in October. 
You wouldn't have your, your infant miles and miles away on a riverbed walking through the frozen stuff and just what's thawed enough. And you can see here, these are a few individuals, how triangular the foot. A lot of these will even have pattern, and like these, a lot of these have dermal pattern, dermal ridging to them. But you can note that that's, does, it looks like a person's foot, but it doesn't look like a person's foot. It's got this wild triangular shape, and that comes from the first metatarsal being kicked back. If we look at the same bones, we measure fifth metatarsal, first metatarsal, and heel, we come up with that same structural ratio we described before. And that's almost always going to occur. Now you can see here is dog or a dog or wolf, and again, same thing. And we look at the prints, and there's almost no arch in sand. The prints contact completely all the way across the print surface. And you can see in this one where there's a little bit of evidence of what they call a mid-tarsal break, which is where the foot can hinge front to back. But what you don't see is a heel plant or a toe kick. Now, walk around the rivers and the sands and try to leave these prints. And I mean, if they're fake, somebody's faking thousands of them because we've been finding them for five years tracking this group. Now, here's in the water. See, these, these prints here are actually in the water. And this is unbelievable cold temperatures. You would not believe how cold it is. So I'll just start rolling. And a little bitty guy there, see, that's, that's the smallest one they've got. So we've actually witnessed uh, vicariously through evidence the birth of two young since we've been tracking the group. Focals. Yeah. This is the first footprint we ever gleaned in the area. Um, it came the night after we recorded what sounded like a large male ripping a large dog in half. And we have the audio to that. It's the most horrific thing I've ever heard in my life. And we did we use... 36 inch parabolic dish and found the location of about where they were and we went down there at 7 o'clock the next morning about two and a half miles away and were able to find their prints. And they range, this is what Amos when his print was only seven and a half inches and he's now print is almost 10 inches long and he's been growing. Which naturally they would have to do, right? And that's all Amos. And then this is one of the females that was with Amos. This is the only print she left. She never would step in anything that was muddy. And it was very difficult to get her prints. But what we find here is if we really look close, is you have dermal, dermal patterning here off the bottom of her foot. And that's, that's not uncommon necessarily to find. Um, but it is very uncommon to find this subject's foot or mom's or the big one from dad. It took four and a half years to get a print from the large male at 23 inches long which is absolutely longer. It's, I've had Bigfoot experts, whatever, tell me, well, it can't be, that's too big. I, I don't, it's not up to me to decide what we're finding. We just find. This track is about 14 and a half to 15 inches long. And for a human, if you can find anyone you know with a 14 and a half to 15 inch foot, I'd be impressed. Um, this is tracks from the second year that from the big male crossing the river. And he left no prints, everything was frozen, except for what I might be out of order, where he broke through snow. And the gaps are uh, anywhere from, this is a seven foot stick, so you can see the distances. They range actually, I think eight feet on this one, uh, seven, and then almost 12 to get out. And he was moving pretty quick when he left them. These are marks from one of the juveniles that was in the river system on his hands and knees. And you can see here where he scooted along on his hands and knees, scooted along on his hands and knees, scooted along on his hands and knees, and then where'd he go? Well, Mama picked him up from over here, flat out of the sand, off the ground, left no marks. Come here. Like you're leaving marks all over the place, get your butt out of there. Um, and there's actually uh, scat material with Russian olive fruit, smaller scat. We have a sample of this sample sitting on the desk over there that was in those marks because he was defecating. And these are his hand prints and his knee prints. And as he scooted himself along in the sand here. Uh, just another big print. I think this one is, um, what are we looking at, 16 to 17 inches. Um, coming up out of this ravine area here, he comes, there's his print. That print's coming right up about a 20-foot wall, barely touches the edge, and then he takes his next step here, never leaves another print. Couldn't find one. Series of prints through the Gauss Bayo that show really strange morphology and two small subjects. And you can see here where you've got some toe digs, but an almost completely flat plant in the sand. And sand's great because we can really see how they apply the weight and things. And here you can make out flat heel and a gigantic diverged toe. 
Um, same thing. The, the same print can look tremendously different. I think we have one, I thought I had one here that had a big bend in it that I could show you how flexible the foot was. Because it's really amazing to see how far their foot will actually bend. It's a lot like your hand. Um, this is the cast. This print here is the cast to Amos over there. Uh, it's on the table. Um, this is the one that was actually taken from. You can see there's there's actually plenty of dermal pattern, both macro and microdermal uh, ridges on that foot, the casting of that foot, and the terrain types. And you can see here, uh, Tony's not wearing summertime clothes. Um, you can it's you can see behind him see snow on the ground. See, and these are miles away in a remote location, and they're walking through the river when it's cold enough for snow on the ground. And we find these in the morning where they were walking the previous night. And they're not walking down here where it's nice. It's, they walk right, the, right across the worst stuff you can imagine, thorns and everything else. And that's why we say if these are people, what are they doing? You know, uh, of course, we, we understand that they're, that they're not. The, this is that same shot that's that one. And you can see here in the lighting the macrodermal pattern here. And there's microdermal ridges as well. And a pretty consistent pattern to the foot is this circular shape uh, in this area of the foot. Even the giant track over there has that same circular uh, pattern in that portion of the foot. But humans don't have that. So, And we just go on down the line. Uh, good shows another one with good uh, mid-tarsal break there. Uh,